Hey all, so today is already the 10th session of this advanced computer programming course and we're currently in the middle of discussing the deferred shading algorithm. Like this is it, this is the deferred shading algorithm, the algorithm rasterization deferred. And we just learned how we made the uh, fragment phase of the rasterization algorithm deferred, right? And we did this by considering the uh, fragment phase overall fragments and the original fragment phase would first in a loop perform lighting like in a loop over all lights would uh, perform lighting for each and every fragment and would then perform the depth test for the fragments and we made uh, this deferred by first of all uh, switching the two operations and then uh, pulling out the uh, shading operation because now, when we um, perform the depth test, we no longer operate on fragments, but we operate on pixels. And those pixels, we put in a buffer. And then, when we have that buffer, we iterate over the, f over the frame buffer and shade the pixels with respect to each light source. Uh, that was the um, formulation of the algorithm rasterization deferred that we learned about, and the motivation here was that um, on the one hand, um, we usually uh, have many more fragments uh, than we have pixels. And uh, therefore, we uh, just um, shade a lot of fragments that eventually will end up uh, being invisible. And uh, people do this uh, because um, that's the only way to support semi-transparent uh, surfaces. But if you, if you make the assumption that there are, are no semi-transparent surfaces in your scene, uh, then you can just uh, reformulate the algorithm this way. And that way you're able to uh, support uh, many more lights than with the uh, rasterization algorithm without that uh, optimization or without that reformulation. And that uh, allows us uh, to, to actually introduce a variable number of lights uh, into this, uh, into this uh, rendering pipeline. So um, in the last session, we ended up right here. So we uh, saw this formulation of the, re of the uh, rasterization deferred algorithm. And we will now quickly analyze the uh, runtime complexity of this algorithm. And for that, we're considering the work complexity of the algorithm. And the work complexity of the algorithm, of course, uh, is related to the work complexity of the, um, the algorithm rasterization too because the algorithm rasterization deferred is just based on uh, this algorithm. And the work complexity of rasterization 2 is just this here, right? And we're now assuming that we have a variable number of lights. So the um, number of light sources now also factors in uh, into the equation. And by reformulating the algorithm, we basically um, pull this multiplication of the number of light sources out because now we don't have this uh, loop, this nested loop, where we iterate over all the fragments and inside that loop iterate over the light sources. But instead, we, uh, we of course, we have the, the, the um, uh, work that is done on the vertex phase. We also have the work that is done on the uh, fragment phase like for um, all the triangles that were uh, generated during the uh, vertex operations and during primitive assembly. So we still uh, have uh, this factor here. And this factor also includes the uh, full uh, fragment processing from before. And then we have a um, number of light sources passes over a fully rasterized screen. So that means that the um, complexity goes down in that the um, O of L term here is factored out, like uh, the O of L term only factors in as the product uh, of the um, full screen pass times the number of light sources. Once again, like with the, like with the second version of the rasterization algorithm that we discussed, we have a deferred formulation of the algorithm, like we uh, made a part of the algorithm deferred, and we buy that at the cost of, uh, of extra memory. Like because we now uh, have to, to um, write the uh, pixels into a buffer. And you can already like, see from, the, from our uh, asymptotic uh, considerations like that, that, uh, those, that extra memory basically gets um, amortized asymptotically. Like 
we need this extra memory, this extra buffer uh, that has the size of the uh, screen. But it, uh, it's, just, it's just an additive term, so this term that, uh, that grows faster asymptotically and uh, this is uh, irrelevant for a uh, large V and for, uh, for a large screen size. And based on those theoretical assumptions, we can now discuss how one would implement this algorithm on a, uh, on a GPU, like what a real-world implementation of this would look like. Uh, when uh, one would implement this, um, he'd um, make use of the render to texture features that is uh, provided by GPUs and uh, that basically allows us to allocate textures and uh, using the pro programmable hardware to render into those textures and then later um, bind them to uh, other programmable, uh, programmable entities on the GPU. Like um, for that, we would just use a bunch of uh, of a of so-called uh, full screen textures, like textures that have the exact same size as the screen, and then um, we will basically use them as something uh, that one would call an off-screen buffer. So we're basically uh, rendering into those textures, and with the intention to not not directly display those textures, but to intermediately uh, store some information in them. So like in the uh, textures that we would have uh, would be a, a depth texture. Like um, the uh, GPU will uh, of course uh, render into a depth buffer and uh, this depth buffer would then in the end be used to uh, display the final image that we render. Like in general, GPUs don't allow us to uh, access this, this buffer. Like in, there are certain uh, vendors uh, who actually provide extensions to the graphics APIs so that you can access them. But in general, with the graphics APIs and 3D APIs that are available, you just cannot access the depth buffer. What you can do, though, is uh, you can um, write depth values uh, into a texture and store them there. So we will have a texture that will store depth. And then we will also have a texture that will uh, store for each, um, for each raster position, uh, will store a uh, shading normal like the normal that is associated with the fragment there. And then we will also have a, um, a texture that will uh, store the so-called diffuse albedo. Like uh, this is just the uh, texture color that we, would, uh, that, that we would have to otherwise have to look up from, from like a texture atlas or from a number of textures. And we will just look up that color during a pass and store it in, the, in a diffuse texture map. Like so that we can later just uh, look at, look it up uh, for each and every pixel, and then we would also have a texture that would store material IDs. Like the uh, texture would tell us for each pixel what the um, material ID is there, and we could use that material ID to uh, perform a lookup in the material library. So in that data structure that I just explained here is what people would call a geometry buffer or a G buffer. And those G buffers, depending on the implementation, of course, can have slightly different data layouts and can actually uh, contain slightly different content. But for uh, the very layout that I just described, I'm showing an example here. Like I, um, I rendered such a G buffer myself, and then uh, just saved the uh, various outputs of the, the uh, of the G buffer, the various textures, and just uh, saved them to uh, to image files. And this is what a, a typical G buffer would look like. Like here. I have a, a buffer containing depth, and I'm mapping the depth values to gray values. This here is a um, buffer containing normals. So, and this this here is the uh, diffuse albedo map. And as you can see, this is basically all the uh, content that you would have in a color texture, and you can see that this is not shaded. Like like the three D uh, scene um, appears flat because there is no shading applied to, to the geometry, but it's uh, really just a color as it comes from the texture. And um, then the fourth texture is a, is a material ID texture, like this is just an integer between uh, zero and something that are normalized and then uh, mapped, to, a, mapped to, uh, to the red channel. So and if you would combine uh, those textures, like if you would perform a, an additional pass over those textures and um, using the uh, depth value, and the uh, normal at the, uh, up the at the texture, you can perform lighting with that, right? Like you can just you would iterate over the uh, two textures, and then you could, for instance, evaluate a, a Lambertian shading model 
we are using only the depth buffer and the normal buffer and a, a single constant light source that is described by its intensity and by a vector towards the light source. And then if you use the two uh, other textures, you can actually increase the fidelity by including uh, extra color information. So with that, we understand the basic data structure. And using the basic data structure, we can, we can implement the deferred shading algorithm. But there's uh, one other thing that, that I really quickly need to explain. And this is the concept of uh, programmable uh, shaders, of uh, shader programs that can run on the GPU. Like um, we will discuss this topic in depth later during the during the sessions um, where we cover GPU architectures. But um, in order to understand the deferred shading algorithm, a bit of explanation about programmable shaders uh, is in order. And so I'll just give you a quick overview. And for that. We once again consider our algorithm rasterization 2, like the second version of the rasterization algorithm that we discussed. And if you think about it, this kind of makes sense uh, that we uh, start off with discussion of the rasterization 2 algorithm, because we learned that the rasterization deferred algorithm is actually an extension to the rasterization 2 algorithm. So we're using the means that we are provided with by the rasterization 2 algorithm in order to implement the rasterization deferred algorithm. And here's like a, a let me re real, really quick uh, recapitulate um, what the ingredients are. Like we have this um, phase over all the vertices and there we perform some transformations. Then that is followed by what I call the primitive assembly phase. And then follows the scan conversion phase. And then we have this phase where we iterate over all the fragments, like really all the fragments um, that were generated for all the triangles. And inside that uh, loop over all the fragments, which you would usually parallelize, uh, you have another loop over all the light sources. And then uh, you would uh, retire the uh, fragments to the raster output units and would perform the raster output operations on this stage. And GPUs nowadays let us freely program two of the phases of, these, uh, of this algorithm. Like the uh, first phase uh, that we can program freely is the uh, vertex phase. And there we um, would uh, provide the GPU with something that is called a vertex shader. And the vertex shader is just a program that is um, executed on the GPU. So the uh, GPU. Um, processes vertices, like the GPU runs this uh, for each uh, loop in parallel and then calls the vertex shader. So the CPU is not involved here. Like uh, the CPU would only initially upload the shader, would tell the GPU what to do. But the GPU is the unit that, that dispatches the, uh, the vertex shader. And the GPU dispatches the vertex shader for, for each vertex. And uh, the same is true uh, for the fragments. Like on the fragment phase, uh, this operation here, the uh, shade operation, uh, can be freely programmed using a so-called fragment shader. And um, it's important to note that this loop over all the light sources would then also be implemented inside the fragment shader. Uh, so that includes uh, the for each for each L in in light sources. Uh. So we're now replacing uh, the those two phases with a piece of GPU code, like with the vertex shader and with the fragment shader. And inside the vertex shader, uh, we um, can influence several variables. Like we have, a, we have access to certain input variables, like um, the position of the firm vertex and the normal and the texture coordinates. Um, we can retrieve as in input, but we can also modify them and um, have the GPU output them instead of the position that we initially provided. And uh, that would, for example, help us to animate uh, the vertices uh, without uh, having to perform copies to and from the CPU. Like if you uh, were to implement an animation on the CPU, uh, you could perf it's perfectly valid, valid to do this, but then you have to um, copy the vertices uh, back and forth all the time you perform the animation. And uh, it's in most cases is smarter to only upload the vertices once so because communication over PCI Express has a relatively high latency and then I keep the vertices on the on the uh, GPU and modify them there for the animation. 
Like uh, there are several restrictions to that. For example, you cannot easily add more vertices um, or remove vertices. There are in fact other programmable uh, pipeline stages that we will learn about later that would allow us to do so, but you cannot do this in a vertex shader. But this is basically what the vertex shader is, is for. Like you uh, can dynamically on the GPU alter the position or the normal or the texture coordinates or um, other vertex attribute, maybe um, some user-defined attributes. So and similarly, on the uh, fragment stage, you can also pro um, provide a user program. And in the uh, fragment shader, you can influence the color of the fragment, and you can also influence the depth of the fragment. And there are also other operations, like, for example, you can discard fragments so that they don't, uh, don't show up. Uh, so you have the ability to uh, supply programs on the GPU um, that allow you to perform uh, a bunch of different operations on both the vertices and on the fragments. And then if you were to implement the uh, typical fragments uh, stage as we discussed it, you would in the um, fragment shader iterate over all the light sources and then just append the uh, contribution, like uh, add the contribution to the current fragment color. Uh, this is like this is um, the way you would implement a typical shader that uh, performs shading operations for multiple light sources. So and then uh, from within the shaders, like from both the vertex shader and from the fragment shader, but the second case is more important to us right now. You can also access textures. Like for instance, I can bind a texture on the on the CPU and um, upload it. Uh, uploaded the texture to the GPU, and then in the uh, fragment shader, or also in the vertex shader, I can refer to this texture, and there are um, certain functions, and uh, those functions are mostly there to allow us to perform lookups that use linear interpolation. And you can also uh, use other filters, like for instance the box filter to access the texture, but on the GPU you have um, access uh, to uh, textures using specialized functions. And as a matter of fact, you cannot only um, read from those textures, but there are also facilities that allow you to uh, write to those textures from within, the, from within the shader. And within the shader, you can also um, compute the, um, like, like you have the uh, current fragment coordinates available, like um, the uh, fragment shader will uh, tell you which fragment it is currently operating on, and you can when you are using so-called full-screen textures, and uh, this is what our G-buffer is comprised of, uh, you can actually interpret the uh, fragment coordinate as a texture coordinate for that full-screen uh, full texture. And that's, of course, a very powerful feature, and this is what allows us to implement deferred shading using the programmable shading hardware in the first place. And we will uh, now discuss uh, how this is done. So structurally, a GPU implementation of the deferred shading algorithm would uh, look something like this. Like, we would perform the depth test for each fragment, and then we would fill the G-buffer. And uh, filling the G-buffer actually happens in a fragment shader. Like in the fragment shader, we have access to uh, the current depth, and we also have access uh, to uh, several interpolated attributes, like for instance the normal or the diffuse color, or maybe the, even the material ID, which might be a uh, user attribute. And in the fragment shader, we also have access uh, to the um, to our uh, full screen textures because we are using the uh, texture feature of the of the um, programmable shaders. And uh, we use a write to texture uh, to fill our G buffer. So we're basically um, using the fragment position to index into the G buffer and uh, filling the G buffer with depth, normal, diffuse albedo, and material ID. So and, uh, this would describe the first pass of our algorithm. Deferred shading is actually a multi pass algorithm. That is, after we perform the path that builds up the G buffer perform multiple passes, uh, one pass for each uh, light source. And each uh, pass that we perform for the light sources is a so-called full screen pass. And this uh, works, works as follows. Um, what we do is we render so-called uh, full screen quads. That is, we uh, render a surface that uh, fully 
uh, covers the uh, screen's area. Like people usually uh, use uh, two triangles for that. Uh, you can also use uh, one huge triangle uh, with some overlap. And the most important thing is that you make sure that the whole screen is covered. And then uh, you bind the G buffer textures um, with texture coordinates uh, to the uh, corners of the screen. So that uh, the G buffer textures are basically drawn uh, to the full screen quad. And uh, that allows us to uh, operate on the G-buffer textures by um, whenever we uh, render such a full screen quad, we bind a fragment shader that has access to those textures. And those full screen quads are, of course, always view aligned, so that we're, uh, that we're directly looking uh, towards the uh, quad. And then um, we uh, bind a, a fragment shader while rendering the full screen quad and the uh, fragment shader has access to the G-buffer. And um, whenever we uh, perform a render pass, uh, we uh, run a, uh, fra a fragment shader. And the fragment shader will like actually only operate on one fragment per raster position. Because at that time where we are rendering the, the full screen quad, there is only ever uh, one fragment per raster position. So there's uh, basically only a pixel that we're, that we're not processing. And uh, when we uh, access uh, that one pixel, um, we perform lighting operations uh, for that pixel by looking up the depth value, by uh, looking up the normal, and by looking up the albedo, and by looking up the material ID. We have all the information available in order to, uh, to perform the lighting operations for the single pixel. So let us, I mean, let us uh, understand how much memory we actually uh, use for a, we actually need to store uh, the G buffer, like like really in megabytes. And um, let's make the following assumption. Let's just assume that we um, store depths with 24 bits per value. Like this is a very common uh, representation for depth, such as that we use a 24 bit uh, depth buffer. And then let us also assume that we uh, have a, a normal buffer that stores uh, two 32 bit uh, um, floating point values, like we're storing the normal buffer in, in uh, polar coordinates. Like there are actually other um, representations to store the normal, uh, which would compress even better. But we just assume that we we are storing uh, the normals in polar coordinates and uh, with uh, two 32 bit uh, floating point values. And then let us just assume that for the um, diffuse albedo texture, we store uh, three times 32 bit um, RGB values, which you might actually also compress a bit more. And then um, we have a, a material buffer and we can uh, access up to 65,000 something uh, individual materials. So we're storing uh, 16 bits there. So just for the sake of the argument, there are of course uh, other possible layouts and you could even pack it more like, but the, with this uh, layout, um, if you would render a, a for, if you would render images with a screen re resolution of 1024 by 1024, you would end up, end up at 25 megabytes. Like um, 25 megabytes uh, nowadays isn't very much. Like if you consider like that on a, on most uh, current GPUs, you have access to like eight, even 12 uh, gigabytes of GDDR memory uh, only when you're in the, like back when you're in the commodity segment, like when you're, uh, for instance, using GeForce cards and on the, in the professional segment, like um, Quadro or Tesla GPUs have even more memory. So 25 megabytes actually aren't that much, but if we um, consider that around 2005, and this is when the when uh, when the when the, this type of algorithm was very popular and the first implementations came out, um, and at that time graphics memory amounted to around 100 megabytes, and so from that you can see that the uh, memory consumption uh, at that time actually was uh, substantial. And therefore, lots of research has actually gone into optimizing G buffers and into finding out uh, how much you can pack normals so that the images still look, still look okay. And that also shows very nicely, like earlier, we said that asymptotically, the memory requirements uh, for, to store the G buffer are amortized. And here you can very nicely see that um, because, like um, 15 years ago, that actually mattered. And nowadays, uh, it's, it really doesn't matter anymore because uh, we have so much GDDR memory. So regardless of the memory consumption, um, a problem that still remains is that the G buffer, that the G buffer is uh, allocated in uh, DDR memory. And therefore, we have relatively high memory access latency. And we'll also later learn that GPUs are 
pretty good at hiding uh, memory access latency. Uh, and one could actually argue that uh, this is where it is coming from. Like those architectures, um, like, like those defer deferred shading architectures were and are pretty common. And they are very, very prone uh, to memory access latency. And I would surmise that that certain memory access latency optimizations that the GPUs uh, implement, um, that, that they are implemented with uh, G buffers in mind. Like GPUs employ a lot of optimization that try to hide latency from read accesses uh, to memory. We will uh, learn about uh, this later, but I personally wouldn't be surprised if uh, quite a lot of the developments in the in this area were um, motivated to begin with motivated by gbuffer architectures. So far, the potential memory savings that we discussed were from lighting pixels instead of fragments, and that makes sense as usually, and depending on the scene complexity, uh, you have many more fragments than you have pixels, and if you light all those fragments you're potentially doing a lot of unnecessary work uh, given that the fragments will later be uh, invisible anyway because all the geometry is opaque and some fragments are hidden behind other fragments. So um, there's a lot of uh, savings potential from just performing light passes over the pixels. But there's also um, other saving potential um, when you use a deferred method and that uh, stems from the fact that uh, the light intensity from point light sources uh, has something that is called a, a fall-off. Like when you have a point light source, you have a model where you assume that uh, light is emitted um, with equal probability in all directions. And uh, you then also assume that um, objects that are closer by to the light source uh, have a higher probability of uh, receiving light than objects that are farther away. And the uh, physical uh, law behind that is a so-called inverse square law. That means that when we model light sources as point light sources, we assume that light is being attenuated um, with distance, and uh, the attenuation is proportional to 1 over the distance squared. And uh, that means uh, we have a, a relatively sudden uh, fall off at some point, and therefore, we can uh, make an approximation that actually doesn't hurt very much. And that approximation is um, that we assume that there is some uh, conservative bounding uh, sphere around those, uh, those point light sources. And beyond that bounding sphere, surfaces will not uh, receive light from, from that light source. And uh, therefore, when we uh, project the light source's uh, bounding sphere to uh, screen space, we can just assume that there is a, a certain certain radius, like a certain certain uh, circle, where there is a light intensity and where there are pixels that can be affected uh, by the light source, uh, while pixels that are outside of that uh, circle uh, just stay unaffected. And that, of course, uh, provides a lot of savings potential because, uh, depending on how far away the, the light sources actually are, like when you're, like for example, in a cityscape. And you have light sources that, like um, lights that are in a skyscraper just far away, uh, you can just assume that the uh, actual radius of influence of that light sphere is actually pretty small. And therefore, uh, you only have to iterate over maybe a handful of pixels in order to uh, light the pixels that are actually affected. So, and of course, gbuffer methods and deferred shading uh, makes use of that, and that actually helps to reduce the work that is done a lot. So uh, there are uh, actually other methods, like uh, so-called uh, forward rendering methods, which uh, will actually extend this idea into 2.5D. Like um, what you basically uh, could do here is uh, you could just cull pixels against, th against those light sources, right? You could, um, before you even uh, start doing anything, you could just, like uh, subdivide the screen into tiles and then first of all, cull uh, those tiles against the light sources so that you know which tiles are even affected by the light source and then only uh, iterate light sources on tiles, right? And the um, forward rendering methods, uh, which are actually quite popular nowadays, like in the recent years, uh, they would do this in 2.5D and, and they, would, they wouldn't see, assume that the extent of the light sources is a circle in uh, 2D, but would assume that the extent of the light source is a uh, is a sphere in 2.5D and would therefore um, subdivide the frustum in window coordinates into blocks.
So this is, of course, an advanced topic, but it, I should illustrate that there is also savings potential not only from the fact that we uh, only iterate over pixels, but also from the fact uh, that uh, light sources have a finite um, have a, uh, have a, a finite reach, so to say, or that the, in, that the intensity uh, is, this, uh, is, is attenuated, usually uh, modeled with an inverse square law. And we can therefore greatly reduce the number of pixels that we actually iterate over for uh, each, each point light. So deferred shading is an extension to the rasterization pipeline and is an algorithm that is highly driven by the real-time industry. Like um, people use this for real-time rendering and for offline rendering usually. And also for high realism, like when many light sources are of importance. So um, that means uh, this technique is highly driven by the gaming industry. Like uh, rendering engines and game engines like Unreal or Unity, they, they implement those concepts. Yeah, there are actually like, like numerous extensions uh, to these methods, like the um, forward rendering method that I already sketched. But also the mere fact that we have a G-buffer means uh, we can also do post-processing on this G-buffer. Like for instance, uh, when we perform the lighting, uh, we can also run all sorts of post-processing effects on the G-buffer. Like what is quite popular is that you compute um, so-called screen space ambient occlusion, which is basically like a um, shadow pass where you um, use the two, two and a half D information from the, from the G-buffer uh, along with normal information to uh, compute soft shadows from ambient light that uh, surrounds the whole scene. And uh, you can also, um, run lots of other like like for instance image filters on top of the g buffer and uh, that's of, of course uh, very helpful uh, that you have the normal and uh, geometry or two and a half d information available because um, image filters that are aware of the uh, scene geometry to some extent uh, tend to be more effective than image filters that have no knowledge about the actual uh, geometry that the image represents there are a number of, of pitfalls, like the uh, semi-transparent geometry we already discussed, and that's of course a, a problem. There are methods out there that uh, try to accommodate semi-transparent geometry in a, uh, in a, a deferred pipeline or in a G-buffer pipeline, like for instance, uh, dual depth feeling is a technique that comes to mind. Um, but there are also simpler approaches like the one that I sketched, and it's actually quite popular that people uh, do a, a deferred pass over the uh, opaque geometry only, and then uh, do some special handling for uh, semi-transparent geometry, given that there is only very few uh, semi-transparent triangles. Anti-aliasing is actually uh, not so simple uh, with G-buffer and deferred methods, uh, because you cannot just make use of, um, of MSAA, so of the um, anti-aliasing uh, capabilities that are provided by the hardware. So you cannot just use them right away, but you have to like um, you have to implement it yourself on the G-buffer. And one could think that it's actually pretty simple to do, like um, one viable way, like it's a bit of a bit extreme, but one viable way would just to render it into a uh, huge uh, full screen texture that is uh, say um, twice as big in X and Y uh, than, the, uh, than the screen or that the, than the window that you're rendering to, and, and then downscale the image that you would obtain from that, right? You would, uh, uh, just render an image that is much bigger than the uh, window that you're rendering for, and then use the GPU to downscale the uh, texture that you've rendered to, and the uh, GPU would use, uh, uh, use bilinear interpolation, and you would uh, obtain anti-aliasing from that. So that's the idea. And the problem with that is that uh, you cannot uh, do this in general with the G-buffer. Like, for instance, when you scale down the normals, uh, you cannot just uh, linearly interpolate no normals. Like we discussed earlier, uh, when you, when you uh, transform normals with transformations, you have to do this with the uh, inverse transpose of the uh, matrix that you're transforming with. So uh, you, cannot, uh, you cannot just downscale your uh, G buffer, your normal buffer, in the same way that you would do it with the color buffer. Right? For the color buffer, this would be viable, but you cannot just do this with the normal buffer. So just upscaling and then, then downsampling the uh, viewport uh, it's just not an option, and therefore uh, anti-aliasing is quite tricky. And what people usually do uh, is they employ some sort of edge detection, and then run image filters uh, over those edges, etc. So anti-aliasing is not so simple. And another problem is also that you cannot just um, simply bind uh, shaders to materials anymore, because uh, what you lose with deferred shading is that mapping from geometry uh, to materials. 
Like when your uh, G-buffer is fully assembled, your pipeline doesn't think, so to say, think in um, geometry anymore. So the pipeline isn't aware of that you are rendering a triangle, and uh, therefore you cannot just um, like have uh, different uh, types of geometry uh, assign different materials. And instead, you have to uh, do this uh, using material IDs, and uh, that obviously makes uh, things com more complicated because you maybe have to switch over those material IDs in your shader. And uh, that doesn't mean it's uh, impossible, but uh, it's definitely more problematic than in a pipeline where you uh, can just. Um, associate a certain geometry uh, with a certain material or with a certain uh, with a certain shader. Um, and then when we perform the uh, very first pass over the geometry, like the pass that assembles the G buffer, it's also not exactly helpful that that we have to duplicate the depth buffer. Like the hardware already has the depth buffer, and there are actually some vendors who provide extensions so that we can access the depth buffer. But it's not exactly helpful that we have to like uh, duplicate the depth buffer and provide extra textures for that. Of course, uh, this gets gets more and get more amortized by um, GDDR memory availability on newer GPUs. Like uh, nowadays, this is really not a problem anymore. But back in the days where we only had like few megabytes GDDR memory, storing those depth values redundantly would that would actually hurt pretty much. So and with that. Um, we've learned about our two algorithms, rasterization and uh, deferred shading. And deferred shading is really only an extension to the rasterization algorithm. And we're now going to switch over to a completely different algorithm, and the algorithm is called ray tracing. And we're uh, going to discuss the algorithm ray tracing in some detail, actually. This here is, for instance, a typical example of uh, the kind of image that you would generate with ray tracing. And it's actually the uh, teaser image of a, a paper that we published a few years ago. And here you can see several effects that are relatively easy to achieve with ray tracing and we will discuss in more detail how to actually achieve them. Um, but what I want to want to point out here is uh, that I'm, I am rendering surfaces that are um, comprised of both uh, polygons and triangles. Like the uh, the geometry here that uh, makes up that building is uh, made up of uh, triangles, and at the same time, I can also support um, like um, general uh, surfaces. Like for instance, those uh, those uh, quadrics here, those spheres, uh, they just naturally can be used in the same pipeline. In that, I'm also using the uh, triangle geometry. And you can see that uh, I can support reflections in this type of pipeline, uh, like you can see all the uh, other uh, spheres reflected here in that sphere. You can see the light sources reflected. You can see that the light sources are actually meshes. Uh, you can see uh, you can see a diffuse reflection actually at some places. You can see uh, soft shadows, like for instance uh, the geometry up here casts uh, soft shadows onto, uh, onto the walls. So all of those are advanced effects that are at least harder to achieve with a rasterization pipeline or with a pipeline that uses only deferred shading. This here is actually another image that I'm quite fond of. Um, it's also a teaser image that we rendered for a paper that we published last year at the Eurographic Symposium on Parallel Graphics and Visualization. What you see here is the so-called um, Moana Island scene uh, by Walt Disney Animation Studios. And they uh, published this data set under an open source license, so that it is uh, free for visualization and graphics researchers to use. And this is just a, a very huge data set. Like uh, when you download that to your disk, like um, with uh, all the animation data and all the uh, geometry and all the instances, you end up with a data set that has uh, like like around 250 gigabytes of, uh, of, of memory on disk. And as a matter of fact, um, the uh, whole geometry is uh, instanced. We'll learn a bit more about what instancing means when we discuss hardware ray tracing. But instancing basically means that you um, have a more or less complicated mesh, like for instance a, a bush or a, 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 or a rock, and then uh, you replicate it a bunch of times. Uh, like for instance uh, the bushes here, um, here on that mountain, they are not uh, like individual meshes, but they are, there's like a four or five or six uh, base meshes. Um, that that are a bit different, and then they are replicated across that hill. And even uh, though 
the um, geometry is instanced, uh, it is like it is like huge. And uh, ray tracing to some extent uh, helps uh, with uh, huge huge uh, data and huge geometry. And it also um, you can see several uh, several of those effects that are very typical for ray tracing on this image. Like for instance, uh, you see the water surface here, and you can see that light is uh, reflected uh, through the water surface. And uh, you can see that the environment actually illuminates the scene, like the uh, the environment that that, that is modeled uh, through a two D texture here, shines light on the water surface and actually also on the hill. And uh, here on the left side, um, the colors that I'm using here they are actually there to uh, to, to to depict the uh, what the base meshes are. Like for instance, uh, this uh, uh, this uh, pinkish color here means that they're all the same base mesh, that this is a base mesh that was uh, replicated. And uh, you can see the, the, the complexity of this data set, and you, you can also see um, what kinds of effects are possible with uh, ray tracing algorithms. And uh, you can also see um, that this is a, a technique that is mostly targeted towards production, like uh, what film studios do. And in fact, this here is the website where you can download the data set and uh, and yeah, as I said, it's uh, it's huge, um, but still yeah, you can download it, and if you can play with it, if you if you like, and if you have uh, enough memory, uh, you can play with it, and uh, you can download it from here. Yeah, let's just start with the first intuition of what's going on there. So the base entity of ray tracing is the so-called ray, and rays are composed of what we will call an origin, and this is basically just a uh, position, a tuple in the R three. And then we're also given a uh, direction vector, which is a vector in R3, and uh, quite often uh, this vector is normalized. And it's a vector pointing in the direction I'm indicating here with the, with the arrow, with the tip of the arrow. So given those rays, we can actually uh, render images, and that would go roughly as follows. Like, um, first of all, we're uh, given an, an image plane, and the image plane is like subdivided into pixels. And then uh, we would uh, generate that something that is called a primary ray, which is just a ray that pierces the image plane. Yeah, it goes through the image plane. Like it doesn't necessarily have to have, to have the origin like here at this pixel, but could also be like like somewhere else. But it's it's associated with the pixel. And then we're also given a three D scene, and then we're basically shooting rays into the scene. Huh? and we're uh, computing so called hit points, which are um, points of intersection. And, and this is basically done by solving geometrically for the intersection points between uh, surfaces and the rays. And um, given hit points, we spawn something that is called uh, secondary rays. Yeah? So we basically shoot more rays from the hit points. And by shooting more rays, we construct something that is called, uh, called paths, uh, like a bunch of rays that are connected at, uh, at hit points is something that we would call paths. So we can also um, trace, trace rays uh, towards the light sources. So this is often done in order to compute shadows. And uh, those are what I would call shadow rays or uh, shadow feelers in the, in the following. And it's, it's, at the moment it's not so important to know uh, how we actually obtain those paths. Like there are some, there are certain laws to uh, how to generate the, those paths, and there's actually a bunch of different algorithms out there that will tell us um, that uh, given a certain uh, hit point, what the next ray is that we generate. And actually, um, it's it's not necessary that we only generate like one ray, but we could actually generate a bunch of rays. But if we have something like this, this polyline of rays, so to say, those are connected rays, uh, this is something that we would call a path. We'll, later we will learn about an um, algorithm called path tracing, which gives a relatively exact solution to the uh, light transport equation, to the LTE. So at the moment it doesn't matter so much how to actually obtain those paths or the rays, but at the moment it's only important um, that we um, understand the terminology, that there are rays, that there are paths, that there are things that are called uh, shadow rays uh, that point towards the light sources, that there are primary rays uh, which originate uh, yeah, at, the, at the image plane or at the virtual camera that is behind the image plane, that there are secondary rays, and those secondary rays in the end will be used to model a phenomena such as reflection, or such as refraction, if we have, uh, if, if we have surfaces 
that uh, bound media that are uh, semi-transparent and uh, that that have similar behavior like glass or like water. So and with that we can actually compute radians, like each of those uh, paths and each of those rays carries radians, like this, ra this uh, ray for instance here carries radians and the ray here carries a combined radians from a from a certain certain surfaces, and then we compute radians and we compute radians for the whole path, and then um, our goal in the end is to compute um, irradians that is associated with this pixel. The physical quantities are not so important at the moment. Like only important to note that a radians is a quantity that depends on both direction uh, and position, and irradians is something that is associated with an area, like the area of, of this pixel here, and so uh, along those paths, we uh, carry carry radians, and then in the end, we use uh, radians in order to determine a, a color for the pixel, which is um, like some type of weighted average. Like we will um, discuss a bunch of different algorithms that uh, help us compute this uh, final irradiance estimate, and uh, they differ uh, quite a lot depending on uh, which type of phenomena we actually support in uh, in the uh, ray tracing pipeline that we are using. Um, like like I can already um, say so much that um, the more phenomena we support, the more compute intensive our algorithm becomes. Uh, so there's actually a whole a family of algorithms out there, and uh, that a whole family of algorithm I will like colloquially refer to as ray tracing. Um, with that, I'm actually abusing terminology a bit. Like there's a, a classical ray tracing algorithm out there. The uh, algorithm that was originally proposed by Turner Wittet, we will also discuss this algorithm later. And some people, actually uh, many people, refer to uh, this exact algorithm as ray tracing, but we will instead collectively use the term ray tracing to refer to a whole family of algorithms. And in the following, we'll uh, discuss a bunch of those algorithms. And we already have some basic intuition how ray tracing works now. And let us put that on a bit more formal ground and uh, get some terminology straight and so that we can later uh, discuss the various algorithms. Like ray tracing is based on the principle of uh, light particles that get emitted by light sources and that move us along straight lines. So and all those light particles, they are called photons. And in particular, this model assumes that light behaves uh, like particles and not like waves. So we're talking about infinitesimal lines here, so the lines don't have any thickness to them. And because uh, we, we model it that way, we also assume, because the lines are infinitesimal, uh, that photons cannot inter interact with each other, because uh, the uh, particles have no mass associated with them. So there will uh, never be the case where uh, two photons hit each other. Uh, and we, however, assume that in this model, photons uh, can interact with other um, uh, particles that have mass, so that uh, photons can interact with electrons. And when photons interact with electrons, they are uh, subject to certain phenomena. So for, uh, for once, um, photons can be absorbed, and photons can also be scattered. So and absorption basically uh, takes energy away from the photon, and uh, scattering also takes energy away from the photon. And while absorption uh, doesn't change the direction of the photon, scattering leads to a change in direction. So when all that is represented via the um, rays and the paths that those uh, photons follow. So um, when there are scattering event, uh, that actually results in paths. And those paths uh, carry along with them radians and the uh, phenomena absorption and scattering actually leads to changes in uh, radians, and scattering in particular also leads to a, a change in direction. We're usually interested in paths that connect the uh, position where we watch from, so the viewing position, and lights. So any other paths will actually uh, not contribute any radians, like they will uh, carry zero radians and are thus of less interest to us, I mean, we're, what we are interested in is the percentage of paths that actually carry radians, and if uh, the percentage is very low, we're also interested in that fact, but paths that carry no radians, uh, they carry no actual entropy, no actual information, 
So we're not not particularly interested in uh, how those uh, in the construction of those paths. Huh? Like we, for instance, if we know that a certain path will just not carry any radians, uh, it doesn't make any sense for us to follow those paths. So we're generally interested in in either direct or indirect um, paths from the light to the viewer. Like here on this image, uh, you can see uh, two paths actually. And um, like this path here is a direct light path that directly connects the viewer and the light source. And then you can also see an indirect uh, light path that like eventually connects the path uh, with a light source. And uh, that on the, on, the, on the other end also uh, connects the path with the viewer. Again, um, when we discussed the LTE, we learned that um, with the surfaces that I'm indicating as those lines here, uh, they are surfaces and they are um, represented uh, through their surface normal. So in the point where we hit the surfaces, uh, we know their um, surface normal. We also know their BRDF. And uh, we learned earlier about BRDFs and those uh, BRDFs, they determine the uh, light reflection direction. Yeah, Like for instance, uh, this ray here and the vector associated with, the, with this ray, like the vector that originates at the hit point and points towards the viewer is uh, the vector that we earlier referred to as omega O. And uh, this vector here would be uh, the vector omega I. And a important trait about um, BRDFs is, um, is um, that those paths are uh, the, the, it's reciprocity. So we can just switch the uh, meaning of those two, of those two vectors and the um, value of the BRDF, so the um, light intensity that we compute, will stay the same. So there is symmetry to the BRDFs, and therefore there is also symmetry to the paths that we construct. Huh? Um, this is actually a very important physical property to light transport, that paths and that BRDFs are, uh, are symmetrical. And this allows us to formulate the ray tracing and light transport uh, problems in different ways. Like um, we can on the one hand um, start constructing paths originating at the light source and then bouncing through the scene and then eventually hitting the eye, like the camera lens or whatever, wherever the, light, the, the viewing position is located. Or we can uh, start by constructing paths uh, from, the, from the eye and then try to find light sources from there. So when we start our, the ray tracing processes, process uh, from the, from the um, viewing position, then we generate so-called uh, primary rays. In we'll, uh, our very first algorithm that we'll uh, consider in the following is the so-called primary ray casting algorithm. And uh, there we are actually only interested in um, paths of length one. And the approach there will be that we cast rays from the viewing position into the scene and we're, we'll only evaluate a local shading model whenever we hit a, a surface in the scene. Like very similar to the rasterization algorithm where when a pixel is covered by a triangle we will evaluate a, a shading function. Uh, very similar to that, we will um, also evaluate a, a local illumination model, a local shading model, whenever we hit a surface. Like, we'll uh, pass the shading function or whatever we use there, we'll pass it the surface normal, we will pass it the hit point, we will pass it um, potential light positions, and then we will compute a, a local shading model. And uh, this, uh, when we are doing this, and this our first algorithm that we'll learn about will be comprised of uh, only this, then we are evaluating so-called primary visibility. So on the very first thing that we got to talk about and that we already talked about when we uh, try to gain intuition about ray tracing is what uh, rays actually are. And let's just put this on a bit more formal ground, like um, a uh, ray is just defined in terms of its origin and its direction. And um, both are 3D entities, like the origin is a 3D position and the direction is usually a, a 3D vector it's usually a normalized 3D vector, like this is not a necessity. We will, there are also cases where direction vectors are deliberately not normalized. And um, we will, in, in, in our case, we will uh, basically just assume that, um, that the direction vector is, uh, is normalized. But in the cases that we will, that we will learn about, it doesn't, doesn't matter so much, actually. So given that ray, so that uh, tuple of origin and direction vector, we can uh, also express that in its, um, in its uh, parametric form, 
and the parametric form allows us to solve for hit points. And the parametric form of the ray is just the ray origin plus the potentially normalized ray direction times a parameter t. Uh, and that parameter t basically just denotes the distance from the, uh, from the origin vector uh, towards uh, that point of intersection or that uh, point of interest i. Uh, so the uh, point of interest i is a uh, position in uh, 3D space, like for instance the position where we hit a, sur where we hit a surface. And the parameter t uh, tells us how far from the origin the hit point actually is. And with that, we uh, can uh, define the uh, primary ray casting algorithm. And when we later do so, we'll start out by generating primary rays. And those uh, primary rays originate at the viewing position, like where we locate the virtual camera. And then we'll embed the uh, 2D pixel raster that is associated with the image that we want to generate. We'll embed it in 3D space. And then we will uh, shoot rays that just pierce every pixel. Like in uh, this case, um, the pixels are like pierced at the center. And like we can, we can actually sample them differently. Like this is not a necessity, but um, in our case, this is what we'll do. And then we will uh, shoot a race uh, straight into the scene and compute local lighting. And then uh, we will analyze that very basic algorithm. And from that, um, we'll uh, discuss extensions. And so when we um, trace a ray into the scene, um, we have to somehow find out if the ray hits surfaces, huh? like. Um, if, if we hit anything, and if, we, if, we, if the ray just um, goes to infinity, like it doesn't hit anything, then we'll just assign the, the, like a background color or black or something to the pixel, indicating that we didn't hit anything. And then if we hit something, um, like we need to determine if we hit any surface. And this is basically done by uh, taking the ray equation and also taking the um, equation of the surface and plugging the ray equation into the equation of the surface and then solve for t. And we will uh, just play this through for ray plane intersections. Like um, we'll, I will briefly show you how to intersect a ray with a plane. And there's actually a bunch of other ray surface intersection algorithms out there. Uh, we will uh, not discuss those in detail, but there are um, ray surface intersection algorithms for triangles, for quadratic surfaces like spheres or cylinders or uh, cones. Etc. Um, we will uh, not discuss those in their entirety, but instead um, I will exemplarily present you how to uh, do this for rays and planes. And uh, from that you understand the basic principle and we can move on. So and here's how that would work. Like we're uh, giving this plane here and the plane can be fully described in terms of a so-called normal vector. So a, a vector that is uh, perpendicular to the plane. And that is also a unit vector. And an arbitrary point uh, P0 uh, uh, that is embedded into the plane, like, like, like a point on the plane. So we're uh, given the plane in its parametric form, like, um, like where we uh, describe the plane as some point in space x minus uh, the point on the plane that we're given times the normal, and uh, those, those uh, dots here, they denote, uh, they, don't, they denote dot products, right? And all that uh, equals zero gives us the parametric form of the uh, plane equation. And uh, we are also, to get, also given the ray, right? Like we're now interested in the intersection of this ray here um, with that plane. So we're given the ray in regards to its origin and its direction. And we're also given it in its parametric form. And therefore, we have uh, this uh, this parameter t here. And what we do in order to uh, solve this equation and determine if the ray intersects the plane, what we first do, we just plug the ray equation into the plane equation. And that is, we have, uh, plug it into the free variable, uh, into this variable x here. And then uh, we end up with this, right? Uh, the uh, ray just goes into the plane equation. And then we solve for this parameter t. And this uh, just gives us this equation here. And with the parameter t, we can um, basically, um, we, we can determine the hit point by just um, plugging that t back into the parametric form of the, uh, of, the, of the ray equation. And then just computing that distance and computing that, uh, and then just computing that hit point. 
And what that uh, t basically denotes is the distance between the ray's origin and the uh, and the hit point. So it's actually as simple as that. And I mean, uh, the pl the plane equation is actually the most simple equation I personally can imagine. Like quadrics actually aren't aren't much more difficult actually, but um, they're actually uh, surfaces that are actually quite hard to, to test against. Like, for instance, if you have um, polynomials with an order higher than 4, then things actually become uh, can become pretty difficult, where you use iterative solvers and uh, things like that. Like, for instance, if you intersect rays with arbitrary curves, uh, things actually be can become quite complicated. And um, then you also have to worry about things like numerical stability, etc. But this is the uh, basic principle of that, right? You have the equation of your ray, you have the equation of your surface, and then you uh, solve uh, however you solve for that parameter t. And like in the in the case of the um, of the ray plane equation, one thing that is important to notice is um, that the denominator here can of course become zero when uh, that pro dot product here uh, is zero. Then the denominator becomes zero, and that basically means that the ray is uh, parallel to the plane, right? And therefore we need some special handling in our intersection function where we just determine if the denominator becomes zero and if the denominator becomes zero then the ray is parallel to the plane and that means we, we cannot possibly hit the uh, plane with that ray. Yeah, and here is the whole procedure in a, um, a, a bit cleaner form. Like uh, we have our ray equation in the parametric form and then we plug the ray into the ray equation. And then we solve all that for, for this uh, parameter t here. And once again, when the denominator is zero, the ray is parallel to the plane and we won't, we won't hit the plane. And otherwise, the uh, t that we solve for just denotes the distance between the ray origin and the ray's hit point with the plane. So, we now know how to intersect uh, rays with planes and we have an intuition how one would intersect rays with general objects. And we're, we're now almost in a position where we can uh, formulate algorithms based on that. And the purpose of those algorithms is uh, to gather radians. And we already talked about radians when we discussed the LTE, the light transport equation. And we're interested in a radiance that is uh, carried uh, along those uh, paths that we're constructing. And then uh, eventually, when, uh, the, when we connect the path to an image pixel, like however we, we do this, what we do is we um, basically splat the radiance across the area of that pixel. And, uh, and by that, the radiance becomes so-called irradiance. So and when we have determined irradiance, um, we usually convert to sRGB. And when we have a physically based path tracer or ray tracer, uh, that ray tracer would compute uh, radians and would uh, carry radians through the scene in the form of spectral power distributions. So and if we had a, at a simpler system, that simpler system, we would instead carry linear RGB values along those paths. And then we would compute the various quantities in RGB. And given that it is linear RGB, we can just perform arithmetic on those. And then in the end, um, we would interpret that RGB as a radiance and would convert it to sRGB so that we can uh, faithfully uh, depict it and that we, that we can just draw it to the screen. And all those definitions will allow us to formulate our first ray tracing algorithm. This uh, first ray tracing algorithm is, is called um, primary ray casting. And we will discuss it and I will present it to you in the next session. And I hope you tune in then. Have a good time until then.